Not anymore. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of This Imaginary Life, a post-game hangout. Uh, this is a show where we talk about tabletop role-playing games, and all of us, uh, it's a roundtable discussion where we uh, we talk about there are many, many years of experience, and if you've got questions, if you've got problems at your table, um, or virtual table, and you, you want some other people to give you advice, then we're your peoples. I do have questions and answers turned on, so if you're watching this live on Google um, Hangouts on Air, feel free to ask us a question. If you see this later on the YouTube, my YouTube channel, uh, feel free to give us some questions in there, and we'll try to hit those on future episodes. So again, I'm Rich. Now I'm going to intro my uh, three esteemed guests. I'm going to start alphabetically because I'm lazy, and I'll confuse myself otherwise. Arnold Cassell, who's one of my cohorts on Cannon Puncture Show. How are you doing, Arnold? It's all right. Sweet. And then uh, we have the... Uh, the wonderful GM who has a super cool like layout, so he looks awesome, professional, uh, and he he left. He got angry at me. Uh, Eric's having a little bit of tech difficulty, so Eric Frankhouse will be joining us shortly. But I'm going to jump straight to uh, Judd Carlin. How you doing, Judd? I'm well. I'm doing all right, Rich. Uh, should we while we wait for Eric, should we uh, jump into our two minutes of what we're excited about? Since we're gonna we're gonna start with that. That's right. So now we're going to do two minutes of what we're into, and it's literally timed with a timer. Mm -hmm. This is crazy. Oh, man. And so Jason Pitt has the first question tonight. He just wants to know how we're doing tonight. I think we're all pretty awesome. How are you doing, Arnold? Uh-oh. Oh, there we go. A little lag there. And Judd, how are you doing? I'm always going to be I'm well. I'm doing all right. It's been a good week. Got, uh, got some gaming in on a holiday week, which is which is bonus, and uh, yeah, can't complain. That is really sweet. <laughs> okay, so who wants to jump into the two-minute pit of awesome first? Should we go alphabetical? We should go alphabetical. Arnold, you want to go first? Just say when I start. All right, go ahead and start, sir. So I'm getting together a game of Usagi Ojimbo again by request, which is pretty awesome because it's uh, an RPG that I like. Um and it's got some tactical elements to it, so it feels a little, little bit like a miniature combat, but it's also got a ton of uh, role-playing potential because you're anthropomorphic samurai, so how, how could that go wrong? And um, my fiancé was awesome enough to locate some files I made about six years ago for the game that I thought were lost, so she found them for me. I was able to put them to use uh, back into the game. It's pretty awesome. We're going to play our second session um, this Friday, and played a ton of board games recently that were a lot of fun. Fabula is a really awesome board game if you haven't tried it. You can play it with pretty much any age group. We played it with a six-year-old, and she kicked our butts. Um, it's a good, fun time where you all get together and tell stories. But it's got some structure, so it almost feels like you're playing Dungeons & Dragons because there's a little bit of like a game mastery element to it. Uh, but it's really, it's really a lot huh. of fun. I think that's it for two minutes. Do I still have time left? I will you give have, my you time to you my just fellow... just now one. Go, go, go! No, I will give my time to my fellow hosts. No, it just goes into uh, the ether. Okay, we'll stop. Is the Usagi Jumbo awesome. game a, a homebrew, or is that something that's... Arnold? It is the... There's a... Uh, an Autumn Moon edition, which Sanguine Games put out. Um, okay. I want to say five or six years ago. Maybe seven. Same guys that did like Iron Claw. Like, you use a lot of dice. Yeah, the same guys that did Iron Claw and Jade Claw, and they just did a new one. Um, well, I'm never going to remember the name of it. Never mind. Um, yeah, they do a bunch of anthropomorphic games, and they big dice pools. So you roll a ton of stuff. Um, but Usagi does cool. the game system a little faster and cleaner, which is why I like it. Of, of all of their systems, it's the fastest system they've got. Nice. And they're based out of Cincinnati, which is where I'm from. So good for us. Sweet. All right. Who's 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 next in the gauntlet? If there's hesitation. I will step up. Do it. Uh, I'll... All right. Cool. Uh. So. He... Oh. Judd. Man, uh, uh, no, no, no. I was... Yeah. There's some gonna, serious... I will time you because I've got a. I've got a. I'll time you. Give me one second. Oh, oh, sweet. All right. Time away. I'm ready to go. Just tell me when. Three. Two, one, go. All right. 
so I've been playing a lot of play by forum lately, and one of my turbo posters, she's got a new job, so she has to go like do other stuff. And uh, I decided I'm going to start a side game with a buddy of mine. And what we're doing is we're running a play by forum game where I'm GMing him solo, and he's GMing me solo with two different characters in a shared setting. Uh, the shared setting is set between episodes uh, three and four of the Star Wars uh, trilogy, and I started creating this uh, this Mandalorian, and I thought, hey, you know, I'll just find a cool pick of a of a person in Mandalorian battle armor, and just in the whole Star Rick, Wars. And, Rick, and, Rick Rogers, Rick Rogers. Not to cut you off, but can we let Eric actually? say a few words. I mean, you've been actually going at it for 15 minutes now. I've been watching it, and I had to come in because I think hey, that... Mike, I'm sorry, buddy. I'm just going to uh, actually boot you out. This isn't a total invite only. I'm not sure how you got in, but... Uh... Dude, you put the link on Twitter. You basically are the asshole that I followed here. Eric hasn't said shit. Richard hasn't said shit. And... <laughs> and... Well, Mike, um, I'm sorry, man. What we're doing is we're taking Do turns. We, know you? we each talk for a couple minutes. Dude, Rogers. I'm going to go ahead and, and Dude, drop you, you from you're this. you're an arrogant prick. Okay. <laughs> well, there you go. You I know you're popular when you have to to you. hate you. Wow. Okay. Hey, um, so I have a little bit more time. And we have. <laughs> yeah, you do. We'll nope, that's you it. Other. That was your two minutes. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, well, there you go. Star Wars is uh, it's, it's good. Who is he back computers. again? And boom goes the dynamite. Wow, that's impressive. Google gods don't like you. Okay, dude. Well, enjoy not being here. Um, that was, I think, he said he got it from Twitter, so that must be from the tweet that I put up. Huh. Uh, okay, we'll have to. Jesus, Mike, okay, dude, we get it. You want to be here. That's awesome. Um, the, we're recording. Yes, I see that. But it's not an invite, so I'm sorry that that was the wrong leak that went out on Twitter. Can we block? Him? There wasn't, shouldn't have been one at all for that. Yeah, yeah it usually doesn't do that. Too. As a matter of fact. Now, if Dude. you can get Eric, or not Eric, but Rick, to apologize. It's not me to apologize to you for, buddy. No, 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 Eric, Eric. Rick apologizes and asks me nicely to leave, and I will not come back again. Or else, I keep popping back in, and this basically ends up being Wait, something... Wait, but we're on this too. You're interrupting us as well. Why are you doing this? Okay, so, Rick, apologize and ask me to leave nicely. Please leave. Eric? I apologize, Mike. Um, and can you please leave? Rick, that's all you had to say. Have a good evening, man. Does anyone know that guy? No. Uh, I don't. I will erase that <laughs> off of my Twitter feed. I apologize, guys. I thought I was putting... Hey, it's no problem, Judd. I gave you the link, and we were trying to share it out so people could join in and ask questions. So I'll, I'll take the, the hit on that one mm -hmm. and apologize for giving you the wrong link. All right, <laughs> so let's, uh, hmm, let's spin this back up. Eric, do you want to give us uh, two minutes of awesome? Two minutes of awesome. What have I been doing lately for two minutes of awesome? You ready to go? Yeah, yeah, actually I am. I can talk about something a buddy of mine and I've been working on. Well, he's been working on I'm going to be. Is oh, that, I think Jeff wants to use the giant display, the time display. The display stuff. board? Okay. I love the display I board. I can't even see it. All right, all right, I'll just assume you're going to yell at me when my... There we no. go. All right, so um, a buddy of mine runs uh, the Midwest Convention out in Milwaukee. Um, it's a large miniature role-playing convention, and he just stepped down as the miniature coordinator. He has a video up right now, and I think I posted up earlier. His name's Scott. And he has the question of what brings you to a convention, like what would it take to bring you to a convention, and what are you looking for when you go? And I've, we've all heard this question. We've, a lot of us have been to Gen Con and other things. So I've been talking to him briefly um, just through posts. I'm actually getting my own set of things together. I'm not picking up the position, but... I go to a lot of conventions, and I talked about going to Game Hall Con in Madison recently, and I've really been thinking about how to make a better con, not a large con, but smaller conventions. Um, and it, it's something that um, I, I bring back to my retail side, being in sales and everything for so long. 
I feel when you walk in the door for a convention, it seems uninviting because while you do buy your badge and stuff, there, there's nothing in front of you. There's nothing to do. There's nothing that grabs you to go, hey, let's, uh, let's play. Let's do this. I wish there were tables set up when you first walked in of a bunch of either new games off of Kickstarter, new games that have been published or recently come out, new RPGs, that you could sit down immediately and pick up and play so that as you walk into the door, the first thing that happens is you're greeted with a new person, new game, and you're playing something out of the box. Instead of having to search through the entire con hall to find something to do. So I'm talking to him about this, and miniature games are actually a really good way to do this because you can do short 30-minute scenarios and be in and out, and from there they can go, hey, we're playing more of this in this room, or if you're looking to something similar to this, here's you know, the five things that are related. Kind of like if you're watching YouTube and it recommends these movies or these shows. So I want to see cons be a little more interactive, but right out of the gate, so it's friendly for everyone. Dee -dee 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 -dee. Oh, there's no I, like annoying alarm. What's up? <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Thank you, Eric. That's pretty exciting. I agree with you. Cons uh, do need Love to be more goal. warm. I, that's why I like games on demand. Really, is the idea that I do too. But they should be right when you walk in. True. I think you should. I don't want to say walk through it, but yeah, kind of. Like I think there should be a hall, and on each side of it should be people running stuff, not berating you and like you know you're getting sold stuff, but gives you the chance to right away playing a game and kind of. There's a lot of people who have those um, the jitters, like they don't want to play right away. They don't know what to do. They just go to the bar and they get drinks, or they don't sit down and play a game right away. I think it's a good way to kind of overcome that issue. Neat. Judd, you ready to throw down, buddy? Yeah, I think so. All right, let's let's uh, let's go ahead and spin you up and give us two minutes. Cool. Uh, I've been playing... Uh, I just started a new game uh, with a couple of friends of mine, uh, and it is, it's, it's free. It's in... I believe it's in Playtest, maybe? I'm not sure. Uh, it is called Into the Odd, and it's a fast, you know, couple dozen pages uh, dungeon crawler. Uh, fast uh, char gen, uh, you know, character generation, 3d6 for each stat, 3d6 for your equipment, 1d6 for hit points, and you just go. Uh, nice. And it's, and it, yeah, and it's it's fun. Uh, I, I, and I appreciated that because it's real, you know, with stuff like that, it's real easy to die. Uh, so <laughs> it, it takes the having fast character creation like that kind of t I feel like it takes the pressure off of me as the GM uh, because my girlfriend nearly died first thing like she climbed some, up something and I was like oh my god if she misses this role she's going to perish uh, <laughs> which which uh, it, it, it's not just because you know I'm dating her it, any player you don't want your players just sitting around doing nothing you know they're there to game and have fun so fast character creation uh really cool ways of leveling up where you don't level up because of killing monsters and getting treasure and XP. You you level up when you hit certain milestones that they that are kind of explicitly put in. So like the first the 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 beginner level to expert level is like returning to civilization after a delve. And then uh, expert level to super expert or whatever the heck the next level was. I I'm not sure I don't have it in front of me is when you uh, invest in a like a, over like a hundred gold in a company, and then as you start to invest gold in companies, you kind of uh, get apprentice characters. And as your player, as your main character, kind of starts to take over companies, the apprentice kind of becomes your character. It's interesting. It's really neat. Good stuff. Okay. Now, who publishes Into the this? odd. I'm not sure. It's Twelve pages long. Got it off the blog. Huh. You know the whole, uh, it's not the whole... a couple dozen. I've a got a dozen? link to That's it. Not bad. Yeah, no, it's not bad at all. I've got a link to it. Um that I will put in the I think it's funny that when a lot of us started started gaming, we started with easy to learn, quick rules a lot of times. Then as we matured in our gaming, we went to more complex games with more rules and more craziness. And then now that we get older, we want to go back to the simpler games again. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it's a very big, yeah, yeah. Tr like, circular trend. I, you know, I don't know if it has I, to do with how I, much I, time I mean, we have in the day. I, I definitely have room 
in my life for like a burning wheel type of thing, and then there are spaces in my life that where something like Into the Odd fits better. So, hmm. yeah. The whole what to do when you die, that's been one of the challenges I've had trying to sell dread to people. Uh, hmm. Because once the tower falls and your person's gone, you know, you're just an audience member. Not, so not necessarily. I think they should be able to um, pull other people's pieces out of their tower. <laughs> oh, nice. Well, I mean, the, the thing with dread is it, it uh, when you pull your piece out, you can die at any moment after that. So hmm. that character can hang around. It's just, like, and, and that happens in horror movies, right? There are characters who are like, oh, that guy is dead, right? He is they so are dead. Of course. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, um, you, you, you become that character, which I think is kind of cool. <laughs> True. So. But the sale, the, I'm talking about the cell. Like, the cell has been tough for got me it. at times. It's, got it, got it. How long does the game last? That. Not long, uh, a couple hours, three hours tops. Oh, for, for Dread? Yeah. Yeah, I would say yeah, a couple yeah. hours for Dread. If you've got shaky hands, you'll spend more time in character generation than playing. Because uh, oh, you build the tower as you build your character? No, you build your character through a, a questionnaire. Uh, mm -hmm. It's very interesting. And I actually, I know Arnold ported that over to a game of, was it Usagi? Or what, what were you using the Dread here. questionnaire for? I kind of did a version of it for Jade Claw. Jade Claw, yeah, where the, the questionnaire, it starts, you don't start with your name. You just ask questions, you, you answer the first question, and then the second question kind of twists the first the answer to the first question. It's it's really, really clever. Um, yeah, you're and pretty so good you end up, looking forward. You have to answer them in, in order, and it doesn't matter what you put. The rest of the questions are going to come back on you. One way or the other. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. like, who's your favorite person, and, and why do they hate you? It's an interesting little bit of adding dramatic tension. Uh, so nice. you end up creating an awesome character, and then there's a Jenga tower, and you take pulls instead of rolling dice to see if you pass or fail, and if you drop the tower, your character's dead because it's supposed to be a you know splatter, horror, suspense game. One shot. I've never, ever played that. It's pretty fantastic. I've seen it around, but I haven't played it. It's the most yeah. fun game of Jenga I've ever played. That's true. <laughs> hmm. I, I want to I play Dread at the library at some point with the, with the kids I work with. So. Oh, that'd be we'll cool. See. If I do, I'll come talk about it, no, no doubt. Cool. Oh, no. Well, unless we want uh, another uh, apology from Rich, um, I think maybe we should just move on to the next, uh, next segment. I'm sorry, guys, to have mm -hmm. held us on uh, the two minutes for too long, so let's move on. Yeah, let's move. Come on, Rich. Could you let some other people talk, Rich? Could you? Could you please? Jeez. Such an arrogant prick. <laughs> He's got me pegged. Uh, oh, uh, boy. If he only knew who I really was. Um, <laughs> Eric, lead us up. What's the first thing we want to talk about tonight? First thing today. Well, now that everything had crashed, let me reopen this. <laughs> Somebody's got to open. I would say read it because my yep. stuff all crashed. Oh, and I left earlier. What, or why don't we go with Why don't we go with uh, This is what you were excited about, uh, Eric. Um, what What accessories and tools do we use when running? You want to start with accessories and tools? All right. Yeah, yeah. You were um, excited about that one. That was the question, correct? Yes. That, that question came from question. Twitter. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Came, yeah. Came to you. <laughs> Do we know who it came from? No, we don't. That was a while. That was a while ago. We're burning out of time for it. Uh, yeah, the accessories and stuff for GMing. A lot of times it depends on the game for me, but there's two things I there always have. I always have a journal. I have a separate journal for each. One. We kind of briefly looked over this before. Um, but I always have a journal with Post-it notes, and I don't get the regular Post-it notes anymore. Moleskin started making their own series of post-it notes, which is what? really sweet because it's got, like, every size. Moleskin Am I breaking notes? up? Can you guys hear me? Yeah. I can hear you. Yeah, Moleskin post-it notes. They're all different sizes and colors. Long, short, but they work really well for tabs in a book because you can fold them over and mark everything. Huh. So I use them for different different colors mean different things. I also sticky the entire front of the book 
with characters and stuff like that for when I'm doing big, uh, big social conversation arguments and stuff like that. I use these. Um, but that's number one. I always have a notebook. I find it quicker to write something on paper than it is to type it out still. But I use digital more for sharing the notes with my players um, and other people who might be involved. And then the other thing, and I've had this for, God, this is probably 20 years old. It's an index card box. Nice. And I have been using this forever. Sometimes it's the only thing I bring with me. It's got all the tabs in it. I can do it without tipping it. But oh, nice. uh, I've been using this forever for all my games, for everything. <clears throat> I do a lot of secrets in my games. Uh, everything in my games, <clears throat> everything in my games is a secret. So there's like an entire box just filled with secrets. <clears throat> Someone says something, I'm like, oh, I really like that. I'm going to make a secret for it. Or I tell the players to give me an index card, and if they pass me a personal note, and it's something like they're doing something that could involve another player at the table, it has to have a secret on there that could be detrimental. So that's a whole box of secrets. And it's really weird to go back and look at the box of secrets. It's almost like the most evil version of the deck of many things to ever exist. Nice. And I pull from it quite often. Um, and then the other thing I got is one of the coolest accessories. It was a Kickstarter. It is Armadillo. So it's a pen and pencil holder because I do a lot of drawing and stuff during my games. Um, it's made to Velcro onto your arm, but it also has a magnet for hanging it on metal or on a table, and it also has a strap on the inside to put it around a book. I actually put it around my beer. <laughs> so it's sitting on the table, wrapped around the beer, and I can pull my whatever it is I'm using the entire time. But it's really good because I travel a lot, so it gives me access to all my stuff for drawing. But most recently, um, I'm going to get into more of the electronical part of things. I don't know about you guys. I have a lot of characters over the years, like a shit ton, a metric shit ton. So I picked up Dark Theater's new um, um, character sheet app. I don't know if you guys have ever seen this company stuff. No. Works fantastically. It's got uh, Pathfinder in it. It also has stuff for, I want to say they added Cthulhu, and I think Savage Worlds is involved as well. But it, it's based on Dark Theater's new, new tools for the old school gamer. And they just keep updating it over and over. The guys that own the company are really, really nice. I've talked to them a few times at Gen Con. But I have all my characters for like Pathfinder Society and for Judge Dread on here, so that when I go to conventions, instead of having to have the, this monstrosity with me every time I go. Uh, I can just have my iPad, which has all my books anyway. Runs really smooth, doesn't crash anymore, especially with the latest iterations. And then the other one, which I can't find the app, but I had something called GM Whisper. Um, and we used to use that when we were playing a lot because people text all the time at the table, and I found it to be a good way to stop my players from playing on their fucking phones the entire time. What because instead of screwing around and texting people, they would send me messages ah. instead of texting the entire time. And it worked really well. Um, the only thing I wish it would have had was a way to download the log so I could put it up in a document, but they never came up with that. Mm. The GM whispers. And it was great because uh, when that was up, the people didn't switch back and forth between their text messages. They would just stay on the GM whisper app the entire time. And there was a lot of plotting and planning. It worked well because we were playing a political assassination game when we first started using it. So it worked pretty pretty damn well. It worked really well for Shadowrun as well because it's super tech anyway. Right, right. That's fun. But that's the most recent things I've been using. I'm trying to think of anything. Um, fountain pen. I love fountain pens. <laughs> totally off topic. Just because you can write in different styles for them. But yeah. That's been the most recent stuff I've been using. Uh, the Dark Theater app has probably been the biggest lifesaver for me. And it's super cheap. I think it's like four ninety nine or three ninety nine or something. For a moment, when you're talking about your pen holder, I, when you say that you put it around your beer, I heard beard, and I hmm. thought that would be really awesome at a table if you could just. I, I no, I don't think I could. No, 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 no. more, okay. more like around a beer mug. Okay. Your, well, I mean, I figured it out, but but I had a, a moment where think... my poor hearing 
I it made me laugh. It's not, I couldn't do it. There's no way in hell. <laughs> it's not that long. I don't have a dwarf. I think I'm a beard, bigger fan sorry. of having a dice tower in your beard, so you just kind of put him in. <laughs> <laughs> just spit dice tower in it. <laughs> 20. Uh, I'm going to go next uh, about the accessories, because mine's going to be pretty quick. But one of the things that I always like to have is I have a pencil box, which is a cool Sith Lord Star Wars pencil box. Um, the pen, my, and the, of course, everybody's got their own, but my personal favorite are the Mirabeau Black Warriors. I just think that it's a good heavy lead, um, and it marks up character sheets pretty well. Um, I like to use a big, thick Sharpie to write on note cards. Um, every piece of something that's listed out that I think in a brainstorming or, or world creation or character creation that I think we might lose uh, because we're bubbling up with a lot of ideas. I'm going to write it on here in a nice, big, thick... I mean, this is, this is a thick, thick thing, so you can see it from far away, and then I throw it in the middle of the table. Um, and then the last little bit that I don't always use, but I would use, uh, I have used with home games when I travel. This is just a little travel speaker. I hook it up to my iPhone so that I can oh, nice. have some background music going on. You know, it's a real, real small thing. Pops out. I got it for like 15 bucks. You can find most of them at Best Buy. And um, I've seen. We used to stick our now. iPhone in a uh, uh, a McDonald's cup so you could hear it <laughs> when you couldn't get the speakers back in the day. That is that is classy. It sounds uh, really good when you're playing Cthulhu. It's kind of creepy. I would be creepy. And and then of course I've got folders of. You know, my go-to games for a drop of a hat, Inspectors Don't Rest Your Head, Lacuna, Lady Blackbird, Shotgun Diaries, and, you know, those are just character sheets and a few extra things. So I've got games that I can hand out sheets to and play at a drop of a hat. And, of course, I've got my, my tablet, an Android tablet. Forgot my dice so. ring, too. Oh, dice ring, very sexy. I so always that's... have this thing with me when I'm out and about for gaming. I swear it's become more of an accessory than I ever thought it was going to be. I thought it was just going to be a little, ah, it's cool, I got a dice ring. No, I use it all the freaking time. <laughs> cool. Uh, so, Judd, Arnold, what about you guys? What kind of accessories and tools? Who wants to go, sna- go next? Uh, wow, I'm really old school and boring. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm very fond of... Uh, there goes Arnold. I'm very fond of... Uh, Notepads, uh, the the uh, index cards. Um, the other thing that I've been doing lately mm-hmm. is uh, getting little pads of index cards, so I can write GM notes kind of in a pad, and then when I use them in the game, I can kind of rip them out and put them in with the other game notes. So like I'll make uh, I'll make a dungeon or uh, whatever with uh, or mm-hmm. you know a note with some NPCs on it you know, on the card, so I can kind of keep it together on the train, and then when I use it in the game, I kind of add it to the folder where the game notes are. But, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, also the other thing is I, I, I gather, uh, um, you know, wasted paper at work with, with that still has a side that's usable and, you know, bring it to the game because you, you can always find uses for that at the game, you know. It's always something you want to draw the map on, and that was paper that was just going to be recycled anyway. So, uh, yeah, I find toss, you know, garbage paper to bring from work. We had a Some guy pencils. who used to use index cards and he would punch a hole through them and had a rod on them, like a, almost like a keychain so he could flip yeah. through them. That's smart. Like swatches, you know what I mean, for color palette. I've yeah. seen that before. That's very cool. Yeah. I, I, I need to figure out a system because uh, for the first couple games it goes fine and then once we've been playing for a year, uh, my notes become a total, almost unusable mess. So I need to figure out some kind of cataloging system that is meaningful or, or something so that I can um, if you have, if you have a computer, Scrivna is my favorite thing for brainstorming because uh-huh. you can actually make Post-it notes. But it's, I believe, it's only for Mac. I don't know if it's for PC. Um, but you can, the way you organize your thoughts is in little Post-it notes on a bulletin board. Oh, neat! And then when you click it, it can open up a document that you have more details in. Oh, okay. So it's kind of nice because you could, and you can do images the same way. So you've written all these Post-it notes out. You could just snap shots of them. And right. use that for the images on a board. You can kind of move them around. Yeah, yeah I yeah. love. They, a lot of screenwriters use it, but I absolutely love that program. 
And that's did that Scrivener with an A at the end? Scrivener or Scrivener? I'll look it up. All Scrivener, the time. and I, there is a there's a PC version of there's a Mac and a PC. I, I know that. Oh, there is now. Okay, cool. Yeah, they Story Games had a link to when it was on super crazy cheap sale this cool. summer, and I investigated. It's pretty. And it's on the iPad now too. I think this is the same thing. My, if I remember an interview, Monty Cook uses that a lot now too. Uh, yeah, I and I, I and like you guys, I love my tablet. Um, I've got an iPad and. It's a really, it's a really slick gaming tool. Uh, so many. I do have my tablet. Yeah, so many game books, all in one, easy to, easy to carry place. Um, um good it, reader. It's gonna, yeah. Oh, nice. Good reader for your, if you're doing a lot of PDFs and stuff, good reader is amazing. Nice. Hey, while we're waiting oh. for Arnold to come back, we did get a question on the Q and A from Matt Jack- Jackson. Um, he asked, "Has anyone played the game called Fate of the Norns Ragnarok?" Uh, which has a rune mechanic, and we want to know if we've played it and what our thoughts on the mechanic were. I have not played this game. I Wait, is that the one that has the actual has. Viking rune stones? Yes. Oh, man. I feel like I've played that before. I don't remember much about it. I don't know if that's a good indication of anything. Um, <laughs> I, I know what it is, though. Yeah. Ryan Shelton bought the game, because I remember he posted up some pictures. So, Matt, you may want to... Um, hit him up. He's on Google Plus. Uh, he's a member of the Geeky and Ganky Network. Um, but uh, oh, okay. I don't know. And thank you, Jason Pitt has confirmed the Scrivener C uh, S C R I V E N E R is uh, available for Windows. And oh, nice! I'll have to get it for Windows too. So I have it on. He recommends Scapple. So it's a great another option for mind mapping by the same company. So thank you, Jason. I've been looking for a good. Um, I used to use one called MindMap, but it's something to actually do plot webs. And I have not found a really good application anytime recently. So, if anyone knows what good plot mapping, like actual circles and squares, that's very flexible, I would love to have something like that. There is, uh, there's actually something that is currently in beta that you may want to check out. It's called Scabbard. Um, oh yeah. It's an RPG campaign manager that has a pretty slick little UI for relationship mapping. I've used... So I was in the beta for the guys who do uh, Hero Labs, their new one, and they had one in there, but the thing I found with, like, XMind and all those, they're very clumsy. And I would love to be able to just pick whatever I want, circle, square, triangle, whatever it is, and then write in it, and then write a couple other ideas out and drag the lines between them. And I wish you could just right-click and change the shape and the color. It should be very simple. And I think that each one of those that are clicked on the left-hand side of the screen, similar to what you have in um, Google Hangouts right now, when you click it, it should pull up a note section on the right. There's old notebooks that look like that, where one half was a blank area to draw and the other half was for notes. It was a lot of times done for screenplays and shots and stuff like that. Moleskin actually makes one similar to that for doing actual, you know, film stuff. I would love a mind mapping program like that, where it's like one step deeper and a little easier to use. I know I'm asking for probably way too much, but Scabbard, I'll have to check that out. I've, I've not looked into it. I probably wouldn't use the rest of it, but if the mind mapping is cool. Yeah, cool. it's, it's, it's pretty neat. Damn it, Google, make me a mind mapping program. Google Draw, go for it. Um, yeah, right. Sweet. So uh, I'd like to kind of reserve some time to come back if Arnold's able to rejoin us because the guy is really crazy good at uh, tips and tricks for tools. He's really cr- like crazy creative and crafty. So. Oh, yeah? Uh, so we'll oh, uh, revisit if Arnold's able to rejoin us. Wait, hold on. There's a guy on YouTube right now called, uh, I think it's the Crafty GM that builds a bunch of homemade tabletop pieces for um, RPGs, and he builds his homemade tiles on cardboard, and they're really easy to do. He primes them black. He uses a stone texture to give them a stone-like feel to them. Dry brushes, but he builds out entire movable you know, dungeon maps, dungeon tiles, so you can build whatever you want. Really, really well done, and then he does like uh, little brazers and torches that light up with like LED candles you get at Michael's, and Every time I look at him, he's done something really cool. I'm pretty sure it's the Crafty GM on YouTube. Wow, that sounds really fly. We'll have to. Yeah, it's it's that. actually really cool. And the guy's old school, which is awesome. But he doesn't uh, he doesn't use graph. He um, 
he measures with sticks almost like you would for a war game. He says that people are a little more flexible in how they play instead of worrying about being in that exact square. They're more about the combat and really getting into what they do. So I think he has a whole series of videos, too, of him playing. Really cool. Cool. All right. Well, uh, let's move on. Let's uh, let's hit another question. We had uh, one from from Jason here that I thought Judd would be interested in talking about. J- Judd, do you want to kind of lead us off on this one? Sure, sure. And Jason asked, uh, Jason Peter, who is uh, at Genesis of Legend over on Twitter, asked, uh, what are some good tricks for good setting descriptions? Uh, and so I feel like when people talk about setting descriptions, the first thing that a lot of uh, conventional wisdom comes up with are the five senses. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, some people will say uh, that you should use every single one, and I disagree. Um, I think sight is the obvious one. You know, that's the one that you're, is probably the easiest, that a lot of people probably lean on the most, uh, or sighted people tend to lean on the most. Uh, things that people tend not to do that are really evocative are uh, are smell. I mean, saying what something smells like, saying what it feels like in your hand, um, comparing it to something that's real is a real visceral way to give people a good idea of uh, what is actually there. And I remember once I was describing, I was I was a teenager, and I was describing uh, a a city uh, made of like kind of busted coral buildings. Uh, on a turtle's back, and I described mm. it like a the buildings looked like a bunch of cigarette like too many cigarette butts in an ashtray. And uh, yeah. as soon as I said that, my my players who were all smokers at the time. Got it. They were there. So uh, sometimes, especially the weirder the thing is, uh, sometimes the better off you are using some kind of uh, simile or metaphor so that they understand what it is they're they're talking about. Uh, so yeah, that would be my so my, my two points there are uh, compare it to something that's real, uh, and and don't try to use every sense when you describe something. You know, uh, pick two, maybe three, and and give them some kind of a feel for for what it is. Uh, and you also have to decide what kind of game it is, right? Like, are they going to have to make tactical decisions? Then you've got to you've got to give that. You know, you're probably going to have to draw a little map. So that they can, so that they have enough info to do that. So it really just depends on what what you're going for, you know, uh, what the game is about, uh, you know. But you you still always want to be evocative and give them that that give them those details that allow them to really be there and show up. How about you guys? Any any thoughts on setting descriptions? Um. Yeah. I- you want to go, Eric? I, I can jump in. Mine's not too terribly oh. large. Oh, well, I, well, all the stuff you said for sure. I also believe in uh, using music to set the mood for a description. So as I'm describing it, I try to have something playing according to kind of what we're playing. It helps keep people in the mindset the entire time we're playing. Um, and that just kind of helps with whatever description you're going to do. If you're describing a car from the 1950s versus a car from, you know, 2075 in some cyberpunk setting, the music you're playing is going to help with that description even if you're using similar words. Um, I Smell is huge. I, I'm a huge person for that. I, I Since I taste beer, I do a lot of smelling, so I agree. If you can relate it to something that everybody knows, that helps a ton. Other than that, I mean, that's, you know, just watch around you, watch your environments, sit down and actually smell and listen in a room that you're in before, like in a bar or a grocery store, kind of trying to remember those, the words you want to use to describe that moment, and I'll write them on a card or note, whatever, and then pull them up later on. Um, my, my settings are pretty, I, I shorthand a lot of settings because a lot of my skill set is based around characters, character development, relationships, uh, so I, I shorthand the crap out of it. I use a lot of, hey, have you seen this in that movie? It's kind of like this scene from so-and-so TV show. I really try to find the frame of reference. It's a lot of conversation I have with the group. You know, that shorthand doesn't always work. But for me, if I, if I can kind of tap the vein of, it's a little bit like uh, 
on Battlestar Galactica, you know, the, the look of that. Uh, and another descriptor that I go out of my way to, to color scenes and settings with is um, mood feels like or the mood is um, and so I kind of oh. color the setting with an emotion. Oh, um, can, can you give me an example of that Rich? That's really interesting. Yeah, okay so um, oh, crap I don't want to lead off with a warehouse right but that's the first thing that comes into your head so uh, you've yeah, got yeah, this, go, go with warehouse. Yeah so Jed you've got to meet with uh, with your contact um, and this Vizsla guy he decides to set you up in a warehouse and the moment you walk into the warehouse the 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 mood is it just feels vacant like this this warehouse has not been used in a long time there's dust all along and it's as if he just picks some place that's completely out of the way and so that's nice. the, you know that's how I drop in with with mood um, because I don't have like I've got dust and it's vacant right. and old right. and that's all I said right because I want as much as possible until we hit tactical and we've really got to have maps I want to go as vague as possible because I really feel like your imagination is better than what I can put in your imagination right 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 you want to let me fill in the fill in the holes mm -hmm. cool well, uh, yeah we're awesome. having an attrition rate that's pretty gynormous tonight holy uh, cow let's bring let's bring that mic guy back Jesus I know at least, at least he was Dependable he came back. He, he he was, you know. He uh he was a tool, but he was a dependable tool. But he was just mean to me. He was pretty nice to, to No, uh, no, he was a shit. Uh you're nice for saying that. Rich, but uh, <laughs> uh let's fuck that see. Guy. Anything else about setting descriptions that we can we can kinda Uh I, I mean I, I would say that the weirder it is, the more you want to link it to our world. Uh you know, I mean, if it's if it's really out there, if you're if you're walking, you know, if you're walking on a city that that's floating in the astral sea that is built on the body of a dead god, then you're really going to want to describe it in a way that that links it to a real city in the player's mind. You know, uh, talk about, uh, you know, what kind of street sounds there are, or or or, or people who are hawking goods in the marketplace or, or something, so that there's something to link it to. Because uh, if it gets too weird, it just can kind of tune people out um, and and just give them then something to latch on to. Weird is good. I love weird. But give it give it something a little more tangible. So uh, yeah, and and just pay attention pay attention to the senses that you like to use and 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 play with that. You know, uh, don't just don't don't just lean on sight. Uh, think about your 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 taste and your your smell and your touch. Yeah, and and the sounds and the sounds that are going through and uh, and Rich added emotions into there, which I think is is the sixth sense. Which is really excellent. It's a good way to do it. To, to give a warehouse kind of an, an an emotion feel is good. Is a neat idea. I like that idea a lot. I'm gonna start using that. Thanks. Cool. Uh, Rich, do you ever worry that putting an emotion on a place is gonna be telling your players how to feel? Yes, I do have that worry. Um, but I also feel uh, I'll trust my players that they may just go about face on that emotion, and nice. if they play too hard into it, then I'll try to present a complication that'll that'll shift it. Right, right. So so one thing you can do is you can give a uh, an emotion about it and then you can kind of contradict it with something else, you know? Um, interesting. Interesting, interesting. Cool. All right. It's just us. Do you want to go to the next question? Uh, do you want to call it a night and just call the show the weirdest show we've had yet? What, what do you want to do, Rich? I don't know. We've definitely got a good half hour worth of content. Um, we could talk about John Campbell's question that he posed. Yeah, let's do it. You and I, you and I could rock this question. I think so. Let's uh, let's do this one. All right. So John Campbell asked us a bit ago um, this question, and I'm going to go ahead and, and read it out. Like many gamers, this is John. Like many gamers, I grew up on D and D. I've become a pretty good D and D DM, if I say so myself. I'm complimented for running fast and fun games. This is great. But all anyone around here plays is D&D, &D or a derivative thereof, so I feel like I'm kind of stuck in that mode of play. 
The only one who will run something other than a and d derivative. Random Spectres, Dungeon World, Lady Blackbird locally. All these are still run as fast and, and fun games. Really want to try something different. Games that are less action and more dramatic and serious, focused on interpersonal relationships, but I don't feel like I have the skill set to pull it off. How do I DM outside of my skill set without letting the game suck? Um, hey, welcome back, Eric. We're uh, tackling John Campbell's question about how do you DM out of your skill set without letting the game suck? And then more generally, how can I grow my skill set as a DM away f from what I'm comfortable with? Okay. Hopefully Google lets me stick around to answer. Um, he asks if are G Google Hangout games the only solution that he has? Um, are there other solutions for playing games other than D&D? &D? Um, so how can he stretch his wings as a, as a person running games and facilitating games? And where are some places that he can try to run really weird stuff? Play in more games than what you currently play. Like play stuff you've never played. Don't run it. Play so you can see how the game is ran. Mm -hmm. Um... For sure. I think watching movies involved around your setting can give you a good feel for how a game should look and feel and how your players are going to expect it because they've probably seen the same movies as you. Um, Google Hangouts is a great place for that, actually, to play new games. It's really easy to get a pickup game, play a two- to four-hour session game, and learn a brand-new system. I mean, for, for yep. sure. Yeah, I I don't think Google Hangouts is your is your only uh, option, but it's definitely a nice option, and it's out there. It's out there twenty four hours a yeah twenty four hours a day, seven days a week. Um, there's there's constant con. Uh, yep. There's there's all kinds of things that are just you know thousands local game and thousands store. of gamers. Uh, local. The local game store that's a really nice option. Uh, local cons are another. Yep. I mean, Eric last week or last month talked about you know going to cons and playing games you don't normally play. Yep, that's uh, why I, think I that's go. A, that's a that's a great way to do it. Um, I I'm gonna bet John that that playing D and D has given you a lot of these skills and and you're you're maybe more nervous than you should be, um, because the, you know you say you're complimented for running fast and fun games, but Inspectors Dungeon World, the Lady Black fun games. Um, yeah. So, but yeah, those are still run as fast and fun. Got it. Uh, I misread. I'm sorry, John. Uh, focused on interpersonal relationships. Don't feel like I have the skill set to pull it off. I mean, look at the game set itself. You know, see what the mechanics are that, that help you do that. Because I, I promise you that whoever wrote that game was at one point probably somebody who played a lot of D&D &D and then wanted to do something different. And they made this game to do that and help them do it. So look at what the game gives you. Eric's advice is good. Go play in different games with different people and you know see how they handle it. Um, and and you know run a small game for a couple people in your group on an off night. Yep. Uh, you know pick two people who are interested and and go to it. Give it a shot. Have a game ready goes. with have a game ready with characters for that day that someone calls in sick. Say so guys, we're Rock still on. playing. We're gonna try a new game. It's gonna be short and sweet. It's yeah. all gonna be self-contained. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean. Things like uh, Gumshoe and um, Dogs in the Vineyard, they all have a mechanic based around something that that designer was trying to, to showcase. And that's the thing I would recommend for that session, abusing the living shit out of. That rule, that whatever it is, just run it into the ground. Um, because that's going to be the things that, you know, people are going to remember that mechanic in the system, especially coming from Pathfinder or D&D, &D, very mechanic-heavy game. They're going to look at that mechanic and go, oh, my God, that made the role-playing experience so much better. And then, the other thing I've been doing, because I've been doing this too, John, but I've been going in the other direction. I've been playing indie RPGs, I feel like, for the past, uh, or, or, well, non-dungeon crawl uh, indie RPGs for the past bunch of years, bunch of decade or decade plus. And now I'm kind of touching stone, uh, you know, touching base with D&D with again. Yep, and 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 a lot of OS, a lot of OSR games, and I'm I'm finding that there are skills that I just never developed because I didn't particularly feel it was important, and now I'm kind of playing with it. So I, I also tell my players, I'm like, listen, this is what I'm working on tonight, guys. Uh, I'll absolutely tell them. Be like, you know, um, when when you go into a dungeon, there's a certain level of description where 
when the players first look over something, and then when they look into it a little closer, and with my narrative background, I just want to dump all of it, all the static goodness right away. And and there's a lot of there's a lot of dungeon crawl stuff where you wanna you wanna ease it in, you know. When they first glance over the room, they see this much. If they look a little closer, they see this much. And so I, I told the players on Friday night, I was like, this is a skill I'm working on. Um, there's definitely watch out layers for it. To, to it, yes. Yeah. Um, so let me know when I'm doing what. So talk, you know, I hate to say talk to your players, but you know, talk to your players and and let them know exactly what you're working on. <laughs> yeah, shut up, Rich. Uh, let them know. <laughs> let you let them know. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, let them know what uh, what skills you're 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 trying to get better at, so that they they can watch out for it. And at the end of the game, they can help you with it. Um, you know, you don't necessarily want to get interrupted in the middle of the game and be like, oh, you could have done that better. You know, I don't want a bunch right. of people double-guessing me. But I definitely want people looking at it and being like, hey, you know, and, and that night as we're, as we're packing up and helping to clean up or, you know, the next day over IM or whatever, being like, hey, Jed, I noticed this one scene. You know, you could have done this and this. Just saying. So that's an idea. Oh, our friend is back. We can't boot him? We really can't? No. I would recommend um, a couple of thoughts that I have. First of all, play by forum. I know you're talking about Hangout games, but you can really try some experimental stuff with play by forum. Uh, understand that it may not last forever. Right? Now, what do you mean by play by forum? Uh, so I'm talking about games that uh, are handled over website fora. Uh, you can also handle play by email. Um, there are some sites like Snail's Pace. Um, RPG Net has a very big play by forum community, uh, RPG Geek also, and then there's rpol.net. Um, what do you think of uh, play by duration? I've never heard of that. What is play that by mind? duration basically is a game format status that plays off time increments that basically would be one person takes a turn, then it, the other person is informed uh, that it's actually their turn. It's sort of playing by duration, and it's sort of... These types of games take days, if not weeks, to play. Sounds like a strategy, more strategy-oriented game. Are yes. RPGs played that way, too? Yes, they are. Hmm. I've never heard of that. I'll have to check that out. Play by duration. Like, So you have a time element to when you can take your moves? Is that what... Yes. There's like a real-world time distress. Hmm. Time duration applied to it. Uh, so, John, also another recommendation that I would have is if your group is only interested in D&D &D and you want to try something different, you know, find another group on an alternate night. Um, yeah, I've had to do that because some of my players just want to play a certain style of game, and the only way I can get to play something else is to play with a different group entirely. Again, why Google Plus is awesome. Yeah, find people local for face-to-face -face gaming through Google+. Plus. Um, if you're if some of the games you're talking about, story games forum might be a good place to go, as well as the story games community on Google Plus, um, and just kind of put a call out. Meetup.com also is a great place to try to find gamers. Not always the best place for small press gamers, but um, you know, so there's, there's some options, and just create a small local group to try experimental stuff. So, any other advice we have for John and his? Uh, his pursuit to try new things as a DM? Try new things as a DM. Yeah. I mean, you, you put it in your own in your own words, but that that's really the way you learn to run new things, just play a truck ton of different games. I, cool. That's why we all have hundreds yeah. of books on our shelves. <laughs> or, or hundreds of PDFs on our iPads. Or hundreds of PDFs on our iPads, yes. And Android tablets. I have a lot cool. of that stuff, too. Well, guys, we, we've tackled three good questions. I feel like we, we brought them all to a nice resolution. We solved all of the problems. I'm kind of impressed by us. Yeah, I, I, liked, <laughs> I, liked the, uh, I liked the starting with the two minutes. I thought that was a fun way to start. Um, Should be a time afterwards next time. where we talk about the two minutes, though, because that was yeah, the whole maybe. reason we wanted to start with it. Yeah, I think right. we did. I think that's good. This is a good section, a good segment for us to lead off with, and definitely a lot of energy. Um, and it gives us street cred, right? Because that's important, street cred. Well, it, uh, it, well, it, it lets the... It, we'll talk about it after the show, but I, I like it. And, and, and yeah. 
thumbs up. Hopefully the next time we do it, we won't uh, have rogue commenters jumping into the show and uh, <laughs> uh, we won't you know, drop a bunch of calls. Google. Yeah. yeah, dude, Google Plus has been dropping like crazy tonight. We lost our other guy. Yeah. I went out lost twice. Arnold. I don't know what the deal is. High <laughs> traffic or something. I don't know. I don't know. Something. Well, it's, right. uh, it's been a pleasure would, talking would, to you guys. I, I would, yeah, I would like to thank uh, John and uh, our Twitter our Twitter folks, Jason, and uh, whoever for was sure. responsible for our second Twitter question, uh, for giving us questions. It gives us stuff to talk about, and uh, we appreciate it. Thank you very much. And, and Matt Jack Jackson for his Q&A on the live. So sorry we don't know anything about uh, Norns. Uh, Maybe we'll find out. Uh, put the name down. Maybe I'll try to find time to play it this week. Wow. That's that's you're the man. Awesome. So let's call it a night. Thanks guys uh, yeah, for, for watching sure. and being on. And uh, have, have a good, good one. one.